Um, we are honored to have our speaker here to present our first bill, House Bill 457. And without further delay, Mr. Speaker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, Tim Jones, representing the 110th District, the good folks of the cities of Wildwood, Eureka, and Pacific, and portions of St. Louis and Franklin Counties. I really appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, you give me the opportunity to present this bill. Uh, as you can probably expect, the speaker has enough to do uh, in, uh, as opposed to carrying legislation, but I had a little bit of unfinished business from last year on a, on a bill that was, that was uh, near and dear to me and important to our state as a whole, and uh, this, this is one of those bills. And so I decided to uh, carry this again as well this year in addition to the fact that the bill made it as far as it did in the process, and uh, I felt that with a little extra work, uh, the bill could possibly be sent to the governor this year for his signature. Uh, if you may recall, for those of you who were here last year, this bill did receive overwhelming bipartisan support in the House. Uh, it was debated as a House bill, and I believe it was debated uh, one or two times further, either when it came back, I don't know if it ever came back to the Senate, uh, on some of the Senate bills on which the bill was as well. Uh, it ended up being on, uh, for a brief period of time, on one of the Senate bills uh, relating to the Religious Freedom Act, which we eventually conducted a successful veto override on um, during special session last year. But this portion, but this bill uh, was removed from that vehicle. So I, I suffice it to say, I think it's fair to say, the bill has great interest and great support in both chambers and on both sides of the aisle. Um, Mr. Chairman, this bill is commonly referred to as the Employee Conscience uh, Protection Act, as, as I've termed it. And it relates to a subject uh, that has uh, deep roots, uh, not only in our state, but in our entire nation. And that's of, of conscience protection, moral conscience protection rights. We've recognized that it's, it's deep in our jurisprudence, deep in our institutions, deep in our philosophy of providing people um, the opportunity to opt out of certain activities. Uh, we probably most notably think about it. Um, it was probably most prevalent when we dealt with uh, conscientious objectors from various wars in our nation's history. Um, a, a corresponding issue, which I think is no less important, is that dealing with the issue of, of life and some of the health care decisions that Americans have to make and are confronted with every day. Um, Mr. Chairman, this bill truly is for workers. It's for employees. And it provides them a shield, uh, not a sword, provides them a shield to exercise their religious beliefs, which are, are sacrosanct uh, in both our Missouri and uh, federal constitutions. Um, the Health Care Provider Conscious Shield uh, is one that uh, we worked on quite a bit last year, and I would, I would direct the committee to some of the changes. There is a House Committee substitute that I believe you are going to distribute if you haven't already, and so I'm mainly going to refer to that. Uh, as I mentioned, this bill was worked on quite a bit, both on this side of the, of the rotunda and the other side. We took a lot of the uh, opponents, critiques, and criticisms into, into play. I should start off by saying there already is a form of this protection in statute. So this was not created out of whole cloth. Uh, and in fact, I believe uh, for some people who may be opposed to this bill, they should be supportive of some of the definitional sections we put in, which give a lot more clarity to what the current law is. Um, the definition sections are, are probably some of the most important parts of the bill. And I'll refer you to page one. We have a definition of conscience. We don't just say someone can just declare a random conscious right and say that, that that should protect them from what the employer is asking them to do as any specific act. There is a lengthy definition of conscience on page one. Healthcare institution is also defined, uh, on, uh, and that continues to page two. Medical professional is strictly confined this year. Uh, in last year's uh, version, we had including but not limited to. There was some criticism of, of that being a little overbroad, and so we've tightened that down to say, this is what the bill shall cover. These are the medical professionals that shall be covered, and they're limited to what is in subsection three. Additionally, same, um, same issue brought up as to spe specified medical procedure or research. 
Last year's version had including but not limited to. This year's version specifically says these are the procedures of research. Nothing more, nothing less. These are the specific items that, that shall be covered. Uh, then we get into the op what I call the operational parts um, of the bill, and it talks about the conscience protection rights that are uh, further, as I say, elucidated uh, and provided for for workers. As I mentioned, a version of this law is already in statute. I think it needs to be further clarified uh, in, in taking into consideration the fastly changing world, as you know, in healthcare. It brings it up to date. Uh, and it provides for, uh, I think, uh, a better application of a worker or an employee, a worker slash employee who wants to exercise their conscious rights. A couple points I'd like to bring out, uh, and then I'll be happy to take any questions, that came up in, um, in last year's debate and argument over the few months we, we argued this, is that uh, there's provisions in the bill such that no one will be allowed to withhold emergency medical treatment. So a couple of, you know, we always have hypotheticals, especially in this area, that way when we debate every year, there's a lot of hypotheticals thrown out. Whether or not they could ever actually happen is, is one thing, but, you know, certain hypotheticals were thrown out. Uh, rural areas providing treatment, you know, where there's maybe not as much access to care, there is an emergency exception uh, in the bill again this year. Patients cannot be abandoned. So again, there's another section in it that addresses that. Uh, no one is going to go without um, medical care, especially emergency medical care, if this bill were to become law. Employees can be reassigned. Uh, that was a, uh, a section that we, we worked on quite a bit last year, and we tightened that up a little further this year, so you can't have that, um, uh, the, the, uh, the employer will not be on the hook for saying, well, I need someone to perform this work, and so if I know you have a conscience objection, I need to have someone here and the, if the employee is reassigned, they can't say that that's an adverse uh, discriminatory action. If any of you know anything about employment law, you, can, uh, you don't have to just be fired to have an adverse discriminatory action. They can dock your hours, even reassign your job title. So this, this bill says if that is done because of the flexibility we have to have in the medical field, that cannot be an adverse discriminatory um, action. And finally, uh, the institution cannot be forced to violate their mission, and we talk about the issue of, you know, if, if, if the very nature of the institution is to do certain things, again, the bill is not designed to be a sword for someone to enter into a certain particular workplace just to cause trouble pursuant to this bill. It truly is supposed to be a legitimate shield uh, for the employee, for the worker to exercise their moral conscious objection rights. Do you have to take any questions? Thank you very much for that very clear, succinct, and lucid summary of this bill. I was a strong proponent of your bill last year, but this has uh, made it even stronger. Are there any qu questions for the speaker from the committee? Yes, Representative White. To inquire. Proceed. Again, I, I supported the bill last year. I, I liked the claim, but I had, you were mentioning employment, and it crossed my mind when you, being from the Southwest, we have a smaller, a lot of small hospitals, small medical facilities. If you're in the scenario where you have a very limited staff, and you're a, one of our small rural hospitals, and uh, some of the, like, a, a, you know, I'm not sure how to read, but say somebody wants to have a tubal ligation. Uh, what would be the ramification, that, I mean, if, if they're hiring a, a scrub tech and they really don't have a lot of them, would that be a valid thing to say, we do this in our facility, are you, are you during an interview, or if they don't hire them because they say they have a conscious objection, yet that is something that comes up in their facility, are they opening themselves up to a discrimination suit? I, I don't believe so because there is a provision for notice uh, in the bill as well. You know, the employee, again, um, cannot use this, um, if, we, if we put this, it would be a new right. Uh, it, well, it'd be a current right that's expanded to cover, I think, more specific areas. They can't use the bill as a sword. Okay. You know, so there has to be some degree of notice, and uh, there is a provision in the bill for that. So okay. that's, that's exactly the concern. It's a great question, exactly the concern we're trying I, to help limit. I was going away from the, the concern of the, the institution that obviously somebody would want to cause trouble with to the, the everyday scenario where you're the only medical provider in the county, and all of a sudden you know, they, they might be concerned that some of the things that people would be less concerned about in those procedures 
they wouldn't be able to do, wouldn't have the staff then to be able to perform it. So thank right. you for the employee uh, uh, cannot use the surprise tactic basically exactly. and suddenly wake up one day and go, oh, I decided I have a, a new, you know, conscious objection to this. So thanks. Any other questions from the committee? Yes, Representative Morris. Inquire, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, do, you, do you remember last year, since I'm new, did the Missouri Pharmacy Association, did they endorse your, your bill? Or I, I, I cannot recall off the top of my head. Well, the reason why, and I think your bill, I, I don't have a problem. I'm coming from the owner's perspective. I have 26 pharmacies, and most of the pharmacies I have are small town pharmacies with one pharmacist. So. So therefore, let's just, we'll talk about abortion drug first, and then let's talk about something else. Uh, uh, we've already arranged with all our employees, so we know which ones would dispense an abortion drug and which ones wouldn't. And we respect their opinion, so, so I think that's why I'm okay with your bill, and I'm, I appreciate the changes you made. I think those are good changes. But, uh, so we also, though, appreciate what the, what the uh, patients want and so we've already got an arrangement so if one store and one pharmacist on that particular day would refuse to fill a prescription then we can instead of inconveniencing a person um, then we will get that filled to one of our other stores and either deliver it or do whatever we have to do but I'm wondering I guess from this if, if this really and I think this is a good bill but if, if this if this goes through then probably I need to have my HR department, uh, and it would be a good advice for anybody in the healthcare business, and especially like small town hospitals and pharmacies, that we probably would want to, when we do an interview, at, from because you're an attorney, from a lawyer's standpoint, HR would probably want to make sure that they wouldn't say, well, I'm not gonna dis, uh, dispense any uh, black box drugs, there are those black box warnings that are, are, I'm not going to dispense a medication the doctor uses that's not for one of the standard indications. He's going off, he's going off, off standard. And, uh, because I can almost see where uh, uh, maybe cholesterol medications, everyone in the room, there's probably people in the room using cholesterol medications, but we all know they have side effects. I mean, somebody, some pharmacist says, well, I'm not going to dispense uh, cholesterol medications because I have, um, I have family members that have serious side effects. So, so I guess from my standpoint, we probably going to have to clear that up in HR. I may be able to clear it for you right now. Okay. Um, when you get into issues of pharmacy, and I understand those are complicated issues, and I already I started thinking about Representative current uh, Senator David Sater's bills, which he generally would file on the, on the totally separate topic of, of uh, the rights of the pharmacist and what they should be required to dispense and all that. I, if I were representing, if I was on the other side, and as a lawyer, I, you know, I always think both ways, you know, so which gets me in trouble sometimes. But if I was defending a pharmacy, I would say this bill does not apply to us because of the definitional sections. And I just went back and breezed through. And health, healthcare institution nor medical professional, uh, as I said, uh, those are limited to what's specifically mentioned in this bill. So I would, I would argue that pharmacy pharmacists are intentionally drawn out of this bill. And Missouri statutes are strictly construed, so unless you are specifically mentioned in the statute, it does not apply to you. So I do not believe this bill would have any application to pharmacists. And if some of the proponents want to uh, want to correct me on that, they can. But I believe that's why we have the statute of the uh, definitional section so tightly drawn to what we're talking about here. What healthcare institutions are we referring to, and what medical professionals are are we including? Okay, thank you. Mr. It's a great point, though. It comes up every year. And when this bill dovetails with some of the pharmacy discussions. Any further questions from the committee for our speaker? Hearing none, Mr. Speaker, do you have uh, testimony in favor? I believe there's several proponents, and Mr. Chairman, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'm probably going to go do other speaker things now and deal with the line that's forming outside my office. We appreciate very much your time today, and thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I really appreciate your consideration of the bill. I might, uh, before we begin, um, let folks know that we are on a very tight time frame today. And uh, so we will be hearing 25 minutes of testimony total, 12 and a half minutes for, 12 and a half minutes against. We have three bills to hear today and we have to go into executive session. So I would be succinct and to the point, 
and try not to repeat any points that have been uh, said before you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Joe Arkworth with the Missouri Family Policy Council, uh, privileged to testify on behalf of House Bill 457. I think we all realize that individuals who choose to go into the medical profession generally do so because they have a real interest in sustaining, nurturing, and fostering human life. Uh, they take seriously the, the credo to do no harm. Uh, and unfortunately, there are certain circumstances which this bill is designed to address where they are asked to potentially do harm to human life, to go against the values and the convictions and the religious beliefs that they hold, and in effect, forced to choose between their career and their conscience a moral quandary they should not be in. This issue was first addressed uh, back in 1986 by this General Assembly, in fact, when I was a member of this body. Um, it was passed, the law that was passed at the time dealt with surgical abortion and the fact that an individual couldn't be coerced to participate in one in violation of their religious beliefs. We've come to realize over the years that, um, well, two things. First of all, that there were exemptions written into that law that have proven to be major loopholes and have been applied in other states to coerce individuals to participate in morally objectionable procedures against their will. Secondly, we have seen an evolution, very significantly so, over these last 26 years of other issues that have emerged um, that were not even on the frontier of medical ethics years ago. We now have not just surgical abortions, but medication abortions. We have uh, abortifacient drugs. We have the whole topic of assisted reproduction. We have, in the medical research arena, embryonic stem cell research and human cloning, all of these issues which weren't even being discussed at the time the original legislation was adopted. This bill, as Speaker Jones has explained, is not designed to stop any of these things from happening, uh, to prevent any of these procedures or research from occurring. What they are, what this bill is designed to do, is to assure that individuals can opt out of participation in those procedures that violates their religious beliefs. The changes made from last year, as the Speaker explained, is a clear limit on the specified medical procedures, a clear limit on the licensed medical professions, our students of those professions that are covered in this bill. We work to address the issues that Met Missouri Hospital Association raised through amendments that deal with notice, employee transfers, and um, that if the work that's involved is essential to the nature of the job and to the central business purpose of the organization, then a discrimination <coughs> complaint has no merit. Uh, I want to mention to the committee uh, that the Missouri Hospital Association made clear to me last year that it didn't really matter what changes we made in the bill, they were going to oppose it regardless, uh, but I just want the committee to know we have done our best to work in good faith with them on this subject. We be happy to take any questions. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, just one, and good afternoon. I was wondering, uh, the word coercion that's in the bill, it, and I have a problem with what's really considered in under that category. Conscience or coercion? Coercion. Coercion. Yes. Uh, if I was just to ask, say, my daughter or a friend, you know, well, maybe we need to go to a facility to get some additional information, and a decision has not been made to have an abortion, but later on they decide to have one. Not saying that I'm sending them there for them for informational purposes. Can that be considered coercion, and, and then you have a problem with having yeah. the bill? So, what exactly falls into that category? I'm not sure where in the bill you're speaking of the term coercion. Yeah. Uh, Representative. That's on, uh, let's see, page three, and it's line 24. I'm not sure whether I've got the same. Version representative that you do is there a section number or subsection? Let me I'll come back to it. Let me find it because I'm looking at the actual. Okay. And I'd be happy to answer your question away from the committee here. Uh, 
if you identify it. Uh, it's on page five and uh, line two. Uh, Again, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the original House Bill 457. I'm not. Well, I was too originally. And it was on page two, on, on three, on that. Describe again where it is. Okay. What's the section? The original, the original is, is on page three, and it's... Um, are you looking at the substitute bill, or are you looking at the original? Both. You're looking. He said he was at the original, right? You have the original? Substitute is on page three, and it's line uh, 20. Well, it goes into it on line 23. Starts at number four. So the, the section that's being pointed out to me here speaks about um, a public official, agency, institution, or entity. Let me read that, uh, Joe. This is, uh, and tell me if this is a section you're looking at. It's in the substitute, page five, line four, start, or line two, section four. It shall be unlawful for any public official, agency, institution, or entity to deny any form of aid, assistance, grants, or benefits in any other manner or in any other manner to coerce, disqualify, and it goes on. So that's the section you were concerned about, the yes. word coerce? Yes, yes. Sir. Okay, now we have a, you know, a, a setting to go forward. So, so, the, so the coercion here doesn't, doesn't relate to the scenario that you described. I mean, this is about a state entity, some state official or some state authority trying to coerce a healthcare institution to go against their uh, religious mission or their religious uh, doctrines um, and, and prohibiting such activity. It's not a private uh, party matter like you were describing. Well, that was a concern before, and maybe we can expound on that a little bit to, uh, to actually address that a little better in the field so it would be more understandable. Yeah, just a suggestion. Okay, right. and I'd be happy to chat with you further to kind of make sure we're Thank you. understanding your concern. How are you? How are you, Madam Chair? I am very good, thank you. Are there other questions from the committee for this witness? All right, thank you so much. Be sure to leave a witness form. Thank you. <coughs> good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Tyler McClay, General Counsel and Registered Lobbyist with the Missouri Catholic Conference. Point one record in support of uh, House Bill 457. As has been mentioned, as we increase our technological ability to do medical procedures, uh, it becomes more incumbent upon us to provide protections for those healthcare providers that have a moral objection to participating in those procedures. And in 73, after Roe versus Wade, conscience protection was provided for people having to participate in abortions. And as we move into areas of uh, cloning human embryos, uh, in vitro fertilization, reproductive technology, those kinds of things that create moral quandaries for a number of people. It's important that we have adequate conscience protection for the healthcare providers working in, the, in those fields. So we go on that support. And I have some good testimony I'll provide to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does the committee have questions for this witness? Seeing none, are there further witnesses in support? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Samuel Lee of Campaign Life, Missouri, we just want to go on record in support of this legislation. Thank you very much. Thanks for your witness form. Do we have another witness in support? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Abram Messer with Missouri Family Network, also representing the Missouri Baptist Convention, the Christian Life Commission. We would also like to go on support of this legislation and appreciate the overall trend of pushing to keep bioethics at the front of the biomedical fields. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you. Further witnesses in support? Yeah. My name is Patty Skane. I'm the Executive Director of Missouri Act of Life, going on record in support of the bill. I just want to point out that as uh, the requirements and um, uh, changes in health care are, are going to be coming uh, from the Obamacare uh, uh, legislation of the federal government. I think uh, we 
have questions about what kinds of procedures will be taking place in hospitals and what uh, these employees will be asked to do. And I think we need to protect them as that comes um, into full uh, activization. I apologize. I have to go next door to uh, register a vote on a very important report bill. Uh, are there any questions for this witness from the committee? Seeing none, are there further testimony in favor? Thank you. I am Deborah Cole with Concerned Women for America of Missouri, and we would just like to go on record that we too support House Bill 457. I'm also a retired uh, registered nurse, and um, just as a concerned retired nurse, I, I, I would very much support this for those nurses that are out there now trying to do, do what's right for the patients. Thank you for taking the time to come and provide your testimony. And your brevity is also appreciated. <laughs> is there any further testimony in favor of House Bill 457? Just for the record, the uh, the side of the proponents is uh, under by one minute and 11 seconds. <laughs> we will now entertain any testimony against House Bill 457. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Daniel Landon. I'm here representing the Missouri Hospital Association. I hope to exceed your record for brevity. Uh, I had sent something this morning to each member of the committee and Speaker uh, Jones regarding uh, four points that we would raise in opposition or at least concern about this bill. Uh, the proponents are absolutely correct as is Speaker Jones. Last year, they, from the version from last year and this year, they have a number, made a number of very significant improvements from our point of view to the bill. We would raise a couple of things that we did put before you. I won't go through all those in detail because of the interest of time. I mentioned just two. Uh, as the Speaker mentioned, there is a long definition of what constitutes a conscience involving definitions involving God and religious belief and all that. Uh, it's a, a commendable effort. It is unclear how a hospital human resources department would know whether that applies to one of their employees without delving into an employee's private religious life in ways that I think many of us would be uncomfortable with. Uh, a second point I would make in the uh, four points we raise, uh, it is certainly an improvement to have some sort of reasonable notice requirement so that someone cannot decide uh, when the patient is on the surgical table that they have an objection. Uh, but we would like to uh, ask the committee to consider uh, further defining what a reasonable notice is. Uh, that's certainly something that could be defined if you let a lot of people get sued in employment discrimination suits going forward. And the common law would eventually get to what it is, but a lot of people get thrown under the bus. And I would encourage uh, the legislature to uh, take a stab at trying to define what reasonable notice might constitute. Uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the committee for Mr. Lane? Seeing none, thank you very much, and I see that you've left your witness form. Thank you. Uh, any further testimony in opposition to 457? Welcome, Ms. Trubiano. Thank you. Good afternoon. Michelle Trubiano with Planned Parenthood Affiliates in Missouri. I will also try and be brief. I did send um, testimony to the committee members last night. Um, so our main concern is that we believe that women should always have um, the care that they need. And while um, the speaker talked about that we speak in hypotheticals, those hypotheticals are real and do impact women who are seeking services. So I just want to go through a few scenarios where if this were to be law, the real impact it would have on women. And I'll be brief with those. Um, but first is when we're talking about rape victims. Rape victims that present at emergency rooms deserve access to all information about what could happen to them, and that includes an unintended pregnancy as a result of rape and ways to prevent that unintended pregnancy. If this bill were to go into effect and become law, it would allow healthcare providers to deny that information and to deny access to emergency contraception. And we feel that that is what is actually unconscionable here. Um, that, um, that women that find themselves specifically in that situation um, deserve to have access to all the information and then deserve to make decisions based on that information. 
Um, other issues with this bill is that while it does have an emergency sort of clause in there that says that you know that um, that emergency care always would need to be um, to be given um, for women whose lives were in danger, is that um, for like for a woman who is experiencing a topic pregnancy that may not be in an emergency yet, but then a, uh, the hospital could deny access to that woman until that topic pregnancy then became an emergency. So we're just making that woman wait until there's actually an emergency that's taking place, until taking care of her when she needs that care. Um, and then the third thing that, that really is problematic is around women who are experiencing miscarriages. And while this um, bill protects the conscience of um, providers that don't want to provide care, it doesn't protect the conscience of providers that know what the right care is and are being denied by their institution to actually provide that care. So it only is protecting consciences in one way. Um, and so especially when it comes to, to miscarriages and that there may be certain institutions out there right now that will not provide care for women who are going through miscarriages, um, but that a doctor at that particular hospital wants to provide the care and knows that a termination of the pregnancy, because that's going to be the end result, um, that they would be denied their conscience and their ability to actually provide that care. Um, so I will be submitting my testimony. I also have a testimony which I sent around to everyone last night from um, Dr. Weisbart, um, uh, just as a physician of how he views the, the bill, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee for this witness? <coughs> Seeing none, thank you. Good. Yes, proceed. Tim Quart. Proceed. All right, just a couple quick questions. You mentioned the uh, emergency room and giving options to patients come in that are raped. Mm -hmm. Are they required now as an emergency room to provide that information um, by statute? They're not currently required, so the law is vague on that, but what we do know is that there are hospitals that have that requirement, um, and so what this bill would do is actually allow a physician or a healthcare provider to go against their hospital's policy of how to treat um, patients in the emergency room who are victims of rape, and that then there's no um, ability for that hospital to have any um, repercussions of that, that employee who's going against hospital policy. You know, when I worked for the hospital, if I went against hospital policy, I was in danger of being fired. Well, this law would protect you from being fired. Because uh, I would at least have to notify them on that I have this. That they would have to understand that this is my conscience, and if I needed to work in a place where, if I was against abortions, they would need to put me in a place where abortions couldn't happen, kind of thing, because I would be notifying them of my right of conscience. Does that understand the way I'm getting head shaking? Yes. Okay, second question. Um, you're saying that it reverses with the doctors working for the hospital, that the hospital can force them, if they would like to give abortions, that the hospital can say no because the hospital makes the choice to not do abortions. Correct? Right, and that's current law. Okay, if I'm... Or current. If I'm a doctor who would like to perform abortions, I won't apply to a hospital that doesn't do them, if that's that important to me, correct? I don't think it's a matter of liking to perform certain medical procedures well, that and, are And like was an improper so, term, I'm sorry. And so I'm talking about, you know, that, that in certain situations, women may need certain procedures because it's the right procedure in cases of a topic pregnancy or in cases of miscarriage. And so a doctor shouldn't need to choose between, um, especially if you're in a small town and that's the only hospital that is there, um, to say, well, I'm not going to choose to work there in case there were ever to be a case. Um, and so, you know, doctors should be able to administer so the then, um, procedures that are best for their patients. Okay, then you're referring to an emergency procedure which is exempted out of this. It's not necessarily always an emergency <coughs> procedure. A topic pregnancy doesn't, isn't necessarily presented as an emergency procedure. Okay, a miscarriage isn't presented as a, a, an emergency procedure. But again, then you're sending the patient away until it becomes an emergency. Okay, well, and, and I'm, I'm apologizing. For, I'm just not following the logic mm -hmm. here. Because if it's not an emergency, I'm attending a hospital where I can't get the procedure performed. I can go to another facility where I can that same day, that same week, there's nothing stopping me from going to another place, correct? 
Yes, if you're not in small town Missouri, have transportation issues, probably maybe have low income, maybe not have money, inability to travel to another place in order to have that procedure. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions for this witness? Um, this is not exactly a question, but um, in your contention that an ectopic pregnancy would not be, it might be uh, passed over as a relatively minor um, ailment. Um, although I currently practice orthopedics, I have gone through a lot of training that dealt with ectopic pregnancy and on a few occasions actually took care of and diagnosed patients that had ectopic pregnancy. And I think it's pretty well universally acknowledged and understood by our medical profession that it is a dire emergency. It is not something that you make another appointment at another time and you evaluate it further. That can cause a rupture of the tube, which can cause hemorrhage, which can quickly cause death. One of my proudest moments when I was a resident was diagnosing a young lady who was out to dinner with her husband and suddenly fell terribly ill. And we moved heaven and earth to, to bring to bear the intervention that saved her life. I believe that is still the case that a tubal pregnancy is not relegated to a minor issue, but rather is treated as a time bomb of death that has to be treated emergently. So I would say in that particular instance, uh, I think the medical community will recognize that as an acute emergency and would bring the proper treatment to bear. Do you find fault with that the discussion of it? I absolutely agree that it is an emergency, but what we know the practice, especially when it comes to Catholic hospitals, and I have um, actually a journal article on this, which I'm happy to, to bring by your office, um, that shows various cases that doctors have experienced at hospital, uh, Catholic hospitals, where patients have presented with atopic pregnancies and they were not allowed um, based on their hospitals um, policy to perform the procedure that needed to be done that was not considered life-threatening. So while I absolutely agree with your assessment, we know in practice that that is not the way that it's always carried out. But the bill we're currently considering now doesn't change that situation. But that's already in place, as you say. Mm -hmm. I'm saying when we talk, though, about consciences, how come we're only talking about consciences on one side when I don't want to perform certain procedures, but we're not talking about the consciences of that doctor who's not allowed to perform the procedure that he knows will save the life of the woman, and the conscience, you know, for him or her to um, actually provide um, the services that, that that physician know is correct. So we're only talking about consciences in one way. We're not talking about the full range of the consciences here. Okay. Are there any further uh, questions for this witness? Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there any further testimony in opposition? And we have about a minute left. Uh, thank you, Chairman Frederick and uh, esteemed members of this committee. My name is Mustafa Abdullah, and I'm representing the ACLU of Eastern Missouri in opposition to uh, House Bill 457. I have turned in a testimony, a, a story from Dr. Ramesh that was published in the uh, American uh, Medical Association's uh, journal in 2007 detailing a story of, uh, of his wife who was trying to see, seek uh, medical attention for a, um, uh, for a miscarriage that was going to cause uh, a serious uh, infection um, and she was refused um, medical treatment from the hospital and luckily enough they were, they were lucky enough to, go, to be able to find another hospital in which they could seek the medical treatment. I just wanted to, to submit that testimony on his behalf. Um, the second point that I wanted to bring up very briefly was the, that, that, our, that our country has decided a long time ago that institu institutions operating in the secular sphere must, provi must provide services to everyone. So, uh, for example, um, if, if I'm, uh, for example, in, in the case of integration, there were a lot of institutions that felt like, well, God has told me that certain races cannot mix. And so, uh, because of that religious conviction, um, that shouldn't happen. Uh, in, another, in other cases, universities uh, were against, um, were against get, bringing students that were practicing or engaging in interracial dating because of a religious conscience. And so integration, uh, I want to make the point that integration is not about violating religious liberty, but it's about ensuring fairness. Thank you very much. Um, we do have, uh, we have reached the uh, equal time for the opponents and proponents. Uh, so at this point, uh, if there are further uh, individuals who do wish to register their opposition, 
uh, I will allow you to come forward, uh, state who you represent, and uh, leave your witness form and, uh, and leave that testimony with the committee. Thank you, Chairman. I represent myself, William Lee, I'm a disability advocate. I have epilepsy. I'm among the top 10% in the nation. And if there's one thing that makes me very nervous about this bill, and that is... I'm, I'm sorry, we really have had uh, equal time for both sides. You can leave your testimony with the committee, leave your witness form. Is there anything, any, anyone further that would like to testify in opposition? To? Okay. Were there any folks who wanted to testify in support that didn't get an opportunity? Okay, very good. That will conclude the hearing on House Bill 457, and, and we will now proceed to hear House Bill 386, and I see its sponsor. Welcome, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is John McCarty. I represent the 97th District of Jefferson and St. Louis Counties. House Bill 386, um, second run, we tried this uh, last year at the end of session just to kind of weed out uh, some of the issues that we might have with it and things like that, fix any problems in the bill that we, that we came across, and we did do that. There was, uh, last year's bill had some uh, uh, stipulations in it as far as uh, felony convictions, et cetera, that were, were unclear, and so we cleared some of that language off up. Basically, House Bill 386 um, bans abortions for the purpose of sex selection, uh, uh, genetic abnormalities, and Down syndrome. And you know, it, I know it's a hot topic. I know it's a, I know it's an issue that is uh, very, very close to people's hearts. Um, so I'm going to spend my time just kind of explaining uh, one the purpose of the bill and to get us to, to consider, the, consider the facts that um, human beings are human beings and whether or not they have Down syndrome or whether or not they are absolutely perfect as we deem perfect being uh, or whether or not they are male or female should not have a basis on whether or not they live or not. Uh, the reality of it is, is uh, there are people with disabilities, there are people with Down syndromes uh, Down syndrome that are very, very capable, that uh, live very productively in society, and yet a huge number of these are being uh, aborted. Um, back in 1985, the Senate report, the U.S. Senate said, physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of life in a human being. A being that is alive and is a member of the human species, there's overwhelming agreement on the point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings. And so everyone is entitled to their opinion, and I'm sure that we will hear a lot of opinions today, but they're not entitled to their own science. And scientifically speaking, um, when we start looking at the, uh, the pre-born child, uh, uniquely in the womb, uh, chrome, we have 46 chromosomes, each and every one of us have them. Uh, it makes up our DNA. Uh, in the womb, there are 23 from the mother, 23 from the father, and at conception, that baby has, 20, has 46 unique chromosomes. It is therefore a human being. And so when we look at which human beings should be allowed to live, and that's what this bill addresses, it addresses the fact that uh, whether or not we deem somebody to be perfect or not, they have a right to live. Uh, we, we have a constitution that tells us we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And while you and I may look at uh, someone who uh, is, is maybe not, uh, maybe they don't look like us, or maybe they don't talk like us, or maybe they don't think like we do, uh, according to our Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Missouri, they still have a right to live. And uh, so my bill addresses some of those things. We're going to hear, uh, you know, probably the word fetus come around and all that because we don't want to call them human beings. But in reality, they are human beings. The word fetus is simply a Latin word that describes a developing human being. Uh, but it's easier to say that uh, than it is to acknowledge the fact that these are human beings that are developing in the womb and they have rights as well. As far as the bill goes, 
uh, very quickly. Um, if you were on the committee last year, uh, some of this will be redundant. Uh, basically, it would uh, put limitations upon physicians that are performing abortions uh, that uh, they would not be allowed to sell abortions. Uh, to convince people to have an abortion because of a genetic abnormality, because of a Down syndrome baby, or because of sex. Uh, all of these things are growing and are becoming more and more uh, available and more and more uh, prevalent in the United States. Uh, we have four states that currently uh, ban abortions for the sex of the sex of the child, and they are Arizona, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and surprisingly enough, which surprised me, Illinois also bans sex-selected abortions. Um, as far as Down syndrome goes, Down syndrome is one of those things that uh, everybody probably knows someone who has a child or they know a child with Down syndrome. And they're very unique individuals, uh, very wonderful individuals that have the same rights and the same privileges as everyone else in this room. And yet 92% of those children who are diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. Um, and I think that's a tragedy. Uh, you know, the, the penalties involved, all the penalties involved in this bill uh, are against the physician that is selling the abortion. Uh, none of them go against the woman. Uh, you know, uh, I did a, an interview a while back and we were discussing a woman's right to choose and all that kind of stuff. And I know that. Uh, when, when the opponents of the bill come up, they're going to tell you that a woman still has the right to choose, and they're absolutely right, they do. Uh, until Roe v. Wade is uh, overturned or whatever, whatever the courts decide in that case, uh, then or, or, or in, in the cases that are brought in the future, then they do. They have a right to choose, and this will not stop that woman's right to choose on her own, but it will prevent that doctor from selling abortions. Um, Planned Parenthood, for instance, this is a, this is another menu option for them. Um, you can go in, and, and this is just one of many reasons that you could possibly desire an abortion. Uh, and I believe that somebody has to stand up and, and say that you know what, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you have one arm or two arms. If you have blue eyes or brown eyes. If you have red hair or, or brown hair, or if you're male or female. Uh, I think that a life is a life is a life. And I think those lives deserve to be protected. Uh, there are a couple of penalties in there. Uh, this is the portion of the bill in which we fixed from last year. Uh, the first, the first offense is a class A misdemeanor, meaning up to a year or a thousand dollars maximum fine. Uh, for, for multiple offenses is a class D felony, or four years or up to five thousand dollars in fines. Um, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure there's probably questions, and I'm sure there's probably lots of testimony, and know your time is valuable, so I will stop there and uh, allow for any questions. Thank you, Representative. I have one of my own. Um, do you have any knowledge of the prevalence of this in other areas of the world? Um, a number of years ago, I was uh, more familiar with the practice as it was uh, commonly done in China. And I believe it still is fairly prevalent in China. You know, China's trying to limit their population growth, and so they kind of they have incentives uh, to reduce the uh, birth rate, and uh, a lot of couples, families, end up sex selecting. They, uh, it is very prevalent in uh, some Asian countries, and China is included. Um, they have since started looking at policies to reverse those decisions because of the abnormal amount of men over women. Uh, violence on women has increased because of this. Um, you know, there's just not there's not enough women to go around uh, in that culture, and uh, so the violence is uh, is outrageous. The violence between men and men, and the violence against women, and uh, so some of those cultures are actually looking at changing some of these policies because they realize that it was bad policy. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing here in the United States is as we become more immigrant friendly. Uh, as uh, immigration laws change and, and new cultures come into our communities, uh, we see them bringing some of those ideas and some of those things with them. Thank you, Representative. Any uh, committee member that has a question for this witness? This witness, but uh, Representative, any questions? Yes, proceed. <coughs> 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Representative. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. Um, I just had a question about um, the comment about selling abortion. Mm -hmm. And so let me go to this example. When my daughter uh, was pregnant with her, my first grandchild, mm -hmm. she was at her OB GYN, and her regular GYN doctor was not there, but the, per the uh, physician taking care of her said that I um, need to ask you if this child has Down syndrome or some other abnormality, uh, would you want an amniocentesis now to rule that out? And um, she said to me, Mom, what should I do? And I said, well, would it make any difference to you one way or the other? And she said, no. And I said, well, then don't risk the amnio. Okay. Um, but um, so in your bill, um, if a woman did go ahead with an amnio and found that there was some anomaly that wasn't compatible with life, right. would this she would not be allowed to have an oh, abortion. Absolutely. She would still be able to make that choice. But she couldn't what go to a provider because the she provider would be penalized. She would be able to. Uh, what what would what it would stop from happening is the convincing of, uh, in other words, you don't want this child because it's going to happen. You're going to have to deal with it for the rest of your life. It's going to stop the persuasion aspect. Uh, it will uh, stop advertising. Uh, for abortions, for sex selection, and things of that nature. Um, and so Is that happening? It has happened in New York, actually. Uh, but, you know, it, uh, it would stop those types of things, uh, but it would not stop a doctor and a, and a, and a lady that is uh, making those decisions from having that conversation. Uh, it would stop, and if that, if that woman came back and decided that she was pressured into that and could prove that in court, it would give her some recourse uh, for that action. Uh, and, and that's really the intent of the bill. The intent of the bill is to, for right now, a lady has no recourse uh, if she is coerced or if she is, if she is uh, um, pressured into having an abortion by a physician or something like that. She has no recourse whatsoever in that situation. So if she could prove that in court, then she would have some recourse in that. Okay. So if both parties uh, made this decision without court, then the that decision would not be penalized. Would not change. Okay. okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Do any committee members have further questions for our representative? Seeing none, are you prepared to bring forth any witnesses? And I believe there are a few here. I will give them the table and go to the rear of the room if you need those who are Those who are in support, uh, please come forward to the witness form. And I would remind you we are on the same time frame. Mr. Chairman, the committee, thank you for the record. Carrie Messer appearing before you today on behalf of American United for Life and the Missouri Baptist Convention. Uh, both have uh, distinct uh, perspectives as to why they want to go on record supporting this legislation. The most important question I think has already been just been addressed, and that is, under this law, this proposed law, a woman would not be prohibited from getting an abortion. It's only a prohibition from performing that abortion if the sole purpose is sex selection or uh, the termination of pregnancy because of genetic abnormality uh, test or fear. We all know that uh, over 90% of these babies with genetic abnormalities are aborted. However, those are tests that includes the false negatives. And I believe the sponsor already said it, but just to underscore it, it's pretty rare to find an adult in this body that does not know a woman somewhere that does not have a perfectly healthy baby who was told at one point this was going to be a baby with Down syndrome or some other genetic problem. Uh, but instead, she chose to carry that child to full term and had a perfectly healthy child. And then we have children who are born who do have issue, medical issues. However, uh, in doing so, Missouri, Virginia, and even Massachusetts has a law that specifies that when a doctor presents a woman with the medical test result that her unborn child may have a genetic abnormality, that doctor is supposed to tell her of all the resources available to her. In Missouri, we have adopted that law 
because in chapter one of our statutes, we say it's the policy of the state of Missouri to encourage childbirth and to encourage uh, and to support uh, every human being. And we define human life as beginning at conception. Uh, this bill simply underscores that in Missouri, we do not want abortions marketed, promoted, uh, or, or encouraged upon someone based on these specific criteria. American United for Life uh, has been involved in this. They have every confidence this is 100% constitutional. The Missouri Baptist Convention's perspective on this is they would rather deal uh, with the ministerial needs of families uh, with children who may have a problem versus the ministerial needs of the women who are dealing with post-abortion issues. So with that, uh, I would like to just avail myself to questions <coughs> and be done. Thank you for your testimony. Do any do any committee members have a question for this witness? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone in further support? My name is Deborah Cole, uh, and again, I am with Concerned Women for America, um, and uh, I am in favor of this bill for two reasons. Uh, one reason is Missouri has a dubious history with the uh, subject of eugenics and I don't have time to go into that now but I do have some information if anyone uh, on the committee is interested in that and I don't see how anyone can say um, aborting babies solely because of their sex or because they're not good enough is anything but eugenics. I also have a very personal interest in this because I'd like to introduce you to, if I can put this around, you can see that there is my genetic defective oldest daughter. Uh, we call her Beth. I call her Sunshine. Uh, she is diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. We just celebrated her 39th birthday. I was instructed by the physician, since this is a genetically inherited disease, that uh, you really shouldn't have any more children. And so my husband and I did everything that we could think of not to have one, and lo and behold, God thought different. And in 1982, I found myself pregnant. And I was encouraged by physicians to have the amniocentesis. And uh, back then, in 82, the genetic, uh, genetic testing wasn't all that great, but they came back and they said, oh, you know, we're checked for four markers, and two of those markers are positive. So, you know, y'all you know, just think about, you know, do you really want to bring another defective child into the world? And, you know, we struggled with that. And um, um, thankfully, uh, my father-in-law looked me in the eye and he said, I will never give you permission to kill my grandchild. And uh, thank God I didn't. And here is second child. She's the blonde. That's Katie. When she was born, they tested her, and guess what? Those tests were wrong. She doesn't have cystic fibrosis. She doesn't have the carrier of the gene. She is perfectly healthy. And right there next to her, that's my granddaughter. That's Olivia. So I have a very personal interest in this subject, and all I can say to you tests are not always right. And as remarkable as our medical expertise is, they just don't know it all. And uh, I just thank God for my father-in-law, who had the nerve to look me in the eye and say, no, I will not give you permission to kill my grandchildren. And I thank you very much for your time and listening. Are there any Further questions for this witness? We thank you very much for your testimony. And bravo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Samuel Lee with Campaign Life Missouri. We want to blood record in support of this legislation. And, and to maybe answer or elucidate a little bit more, uh, Mr. Chairman, your, your question about this practice. Uh, there are uh, some organizations that have risen up in recent years, um, not necessarily pro-life based organizations, but just organizations that are very concerned about um, 
uh, abortions on, on females and infanticide of females. And I would just refer the committee to a couple different groups. One is called 50 Million Missing, and that refers to the number of uh, girls who have been killed in India. And it was founded by a, a, a pro-choice feminist, uh, Rita Banerjee, who is, um, supports abortion in general, but is opposed to abortion specifically for the uh, gender or sex of the child, and sees it as part of a continuum of violence against women. And there is a, a relatively new movie out that came out last year. It's not available online yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to try to get a copy of it sometime in the future, called It's a Girl. And it, it basically describes how the three deadliest words in the, in the world right now are it's a girl in certain countries, because that could be a death sentence for that child. Uh, India has banned um, the use of ultrasound for the purpose of sex selection abortion, um, something that we haven't even done in, in, here in Missouri. But it continues there because it is being done illegally. So it is a problem, and it is a growing problem in the United States. Thank you for that testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? Thanks very much. We still have uh, right at four minutes for performance. And again, I'll leave a witness for him. One, one other thing, just a little detail. Uh, we came into session as a subcommittee. We have had for some time now a quorum. So we were officially going to session as the committee of the whole. Proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Tyler McClay, General Counsel for the Missouri Catholic Conference. Just want to go on record and support the bill. I've got a written testimony for you that in the interest of time, I will leave with you. And uh, thank you. <coughs> Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Joe Artworth with the Missouri Family Policy Council. We would like to register our support for Representative McCarty's bill. Thank you very much. And we have approximately three minutes left. Welcome. Um, Patty Skane, again, with uh, the Executive Director of Missouri Right to Life. Uh, we want to go on record in support of the bill. Just want to point out a couple of things. Um, uh, we know families are being downsized. You know, economy and everything else kind of um, dictates that for some people. Uh, but we also, I believe, and I think it's uh, pretty apparent that there's a thought that, you know, the perfect family is one boy, one girl. And uh, so we certainly don't want to discriminate against unborn female babies. I also, the concern about the disability uh, of these uh, unborn children, um, when I was pregnant at 33, I was not given any um, information about um, testing or anything else. Two years, that was my first pregnancy, two years later, at 35 I was. And you know, did anything that significant change in two years? I really believe that doctors are... Um, given, if not requirements, strongly urged to encourage these tests due to insurance concerns and lawsuit. And um, sometimes I think the doctors themselves are at, uh, in a, not a, maybe a coercive situation, but certainly they may be doing things that they're not even comfortable with because they're doing it uh, as a requirement or a, a, a strong suggestion for their insurance. And so I think, in a way, this bill will actually protect doctors from being required to do that type of thing. And so um, I think that's certainly another uh, thing that we need to, to um, recognize, that maybe all doctors aren't always willing to doing this type of, of counseling, if you want to call it that. And um, that's really all I have, other than what's already been stated. Get my mind to work. Thank you very much for your testimony. Please leave a witness form. And are there any questions? We have another 50 seconds for those in favor. My name is Joanne Schrader. I'm here as an individual. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things and feel free to cut me off when the time comes. Um, live action has. Um, been videotaping undercover at Planned Parenthood facilities 
and has shown that they are willing to facilitate sex selection abortions when the mother comes in and says that's the reason she wants to abort the baby. Also, nothing I've read in the Doe and uh, Roe decisions said that a mother has been entitled to an abortion because the child is the wrong gender or for the child's health. It deals with the mother's health, not the child's health. And we, I watched a movie last week on Oscar Tiller about late-term abortions, and women who had those abortions said they didn't want their child to suffer, but we're not necessarily saying that these children are suffering. If you look at Rick Santorum's daughter, Bella, she's smiling. She's not suffering. She lived three years, and they were encouraged to abort her with price only 18. Um, so I just don't believe we should discriminate against children for those reasons. We thank you very much for coming and providing your testimony. I see you've already completed your witness form, and thank you. We've gone over slightly for the proponents, and so we will do the same for the opponents. And if there is no further testimony in favor, we would then entertain testimony against House Bill 386. Welcome back, Ms. Trubiano. Thank you. Good afternoon. Michelle Trubiano with Planned Parenthood Affiliates in Missouri. And I'd first like to start with addressing Representative Kirkton's um, question and um, about if a woman did have a test and it revealed um, severe genetic anomalies, and that woman wanted to pursue an abortion um, after making a very complex and personal decision, but believing that abortion um, was the right thing for her family and for her child, um, would it be illegal? I believe that the answer that the sponsor gave was no, it would not be banned. But my interpretation of what is written in the bill and I can direct you to page two under section 188.287 um, towards the, the bottom of the page. It says, no person shall intentionally perform or attempt to perform an abortion with knowledge that the pregnant woman is seeking the abortion solely because the unborn child has been diagnosed with either genetic abnormality or potential for a genetic abnorm abnormality. I think it's very clear that in that situation that that abortion would be illegal. Um, it has nothing to do, as the sponsor you know, talked about, it would ban the, the doctor from persuading or coercing or talking about that this is one of the options. It's very clear that if that is the reason why a woman is seeking an abortion is because of the um, tragic situation that many women find themselves in with much one in pregnancies that are diagnosed with severe um, fatal genetic abnorm abnormalities that are not compatible with life. Um, that if the woman, if that's her sole reason for seeking that abortion, which in these instances, that is the sole reason, um, that that would be banned. And so this has nothing to do with, uh, with the, a doctor or the information that they receive. That, that, that I believe is clearly written, and I'm happy to follow up with the sponsor to see if we're interpreting something completely different. But that, that line that I read, I think, clearly indicates that in the situation Representative Perkton um, talked about, that that abortion would be banned. And so um, I, I sent my testimony, and so you're, you're welcome to read that. But along with, sorry, along with my testimony, I also sent um, the story of Liz Reed Katz, um, a very personal um, story. She did testify last year, so some of you may remember her from last year from Columbia, of her abortion, um, of a much wanted and loved pregnancy, um, that she received tragic news of her baby was not healthy. Severe things were going on, severe complications. And although it broke her heart um, that she had to make a decision that she never wanted to be in a position of making. And we see this throughout Missouri and throughout the country of these much wanted, much loved pregnancies that, um, that up until that time, um, the families are overjoyed. And they're not making these decisions lightly that these are heartbreaking, heart-wrenching decisions that they're having to make um, in order to do what they believe is right. And for a legislature to sit up here and to say, we know what's right for them, and that's talking about government intrusion in the worst. And I just really hope that you'll take the time to read her story, because this is happening every day. And these are the real women that you're affecting. These are the decisions that you're taking away from them. And this just isn't right. This is not right that, that women who are, who are facing just enormous 
um, obstacles that you're trying to say, we know what's right for you and we know what's right for your family. So I really hope that you take the opportunity to read her story. Um, she could not make it up here today, but she's also happy to talk to any of you who, who want to talk about what, what that was like. And she knows countless women across the country who face similar situations. And her situation would have been banned under this law. Her situation, she would have been, when you talk about coercion and persuasion, it would have been the government coercing her to carry that pregnancy. It would have been the government persuading her. And so that's what we're really talking about here. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this way? Seeing none, thank you very much. And the next witness in opposition to House Bill 386. Good afternoon, Chairman and, uh, and members of this committee. My name is Mustafa Abdullah, and I'm representing the ACLU of Eastern Missouri in opposition to this bill. Uh, the ACLU of Eastern Missouri has a, a proud history of fighting for the rights of those who are disabled and fighting for the rights of women and, and helping to ensure that we have strong and healthy families here in Missouri. But um, we are opposed to this bill primarily because of the, inter the interference that uh, the government can play in a woman's private medical decisions. And I think that we need to keep in mind that every pregnancy is 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 um, is different, and uh, so we don't we we're concerned number one with um, with with restricting a woman's access to abortion care, and um, and requiring healthcare providers to monitor the reasons that a woman is uh, going through with an abortion. I don't want the doctors to become investigators or the women to become suspects. And um, I don't think it's a good idea for government to be interfering with uh, the relationship that a woman has with her doctor. The, uh, the second point that I would like to make is that I believe that the bill may be unconstitutional considering the, the, uh, the decisions that SCOTUS made in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey uh, because SCOTUS said that in the 14th Amendment that it protects a, a woman's right to choice to, to have an abortion for any reason prior to fetal viability. I think after fetal viability, there are some restrictions that are imposed, uh, but before then, a woman, a woman has a right to, to choose. And so uh, I, think, uh, I think that actually that, that right to choose solely based on uh, disability or the gender of the child is still uh, protected by the Constitution. And I, and I want to reiterate as a third point that, that we are committed to combating the discrimination and, and, and gender-based violence. Um, but, but we want to be working on comprehensive long-term solutions to improve the lives of these women as well as to improve the lives of, of those who are disabled. And so um, in, in conclusion, I, I would encourage you to vote no on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Abdul. I, uh, I have a question for you. And uh, I guess it's sort of a legal question too. But it appears to me that the ACO, you, and you, I suppose you're an attorney, aren't you? No, sir. I'm oh. a program associate. Okay, okay. I'll okay. do my best to try to answer no, no, your that's question. Fine. That's fine. Uh, it would have been more appropriate if you're an attorney, but still. Um, it appears that your organization has um, a bit of a conflict of interest, but has chosen to advocate for the woman. And I just wonder if that is personally, or for the ACLU, a difficult choice whether to advocate for the child or to advocate for the woman, and how did I mean? How did that process work in ACLU? Uh, obviously, I think sure. you've decided to come down and, and and represent the interests of the woman. But was there any discussion about consideration of representing the interests of the child? Well, our our concern is fundamentally that we think that there may be a theological worldview that is in conflict with the Supreme Court's definition of personhood. I think that the representative who, who is sponsoring this bill is, is absolutely right that you know the Supreme until the Supreme Court's decision on Roe v. Wade is overturned, that there's still some challenges that remain internally. I think this is clearly a constitutional challenge um, that's at stake. I, I think you've cleared it up. Is it? It comes down basically to the child doesn't really have person status in the ACLU's point of view. Well, I mean, is that right? I mean, because if the child had person status you'd really have a problem about who you would represent and, and advocate for. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm not an attorney, but uh, the, I mean, the, the stance is, is that 
the, the Supreme Court has already ruled on what is personhood, and so we're just abiding by what the what the. I understand. What, I'm not trying to be organized. So, I really just wanted to understand because you know, if it were that the baby had personhood status, you guys would have a real problem. Really, and just, wouldn't you? I mean, it'd be hard to advocate for. You'd have a conflict of interest built in. Yeah, and I, and to be honest, I'm not aware of what would be the precedent in that particular theoretical example. So, I, I, as as I'm not an attorney, I won't be able to respond. Well, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, yes, proceed. Senator Clark, just real quickly, um, in, in your testimony and the testimony before, it sounds like this bill will prohibit abortions, but in the testimony of the bill's sponsor or his begin opening remarks that this doesn't change Roe versus Wade at all, you can still have the abortion, there's no penalties on the mother, There's, uh, it's just stopping a coercion of sorts towards sex selection and terminating pregnancies with disabilities or uh, abnormalities. Um, so could you kind of, kind of straighten out the, the process here, because it sounds like you're saying we're stopping abortions, but yet we're not stopping abortions. Where's your stance on that? So, um, as I understand the bill as it is written, uh, the, there are two sections on page two, section 188.281 and section 188.287 that say that, uh, that, that it will be made illegal for an abortion to be completed uh, based solely on the, um, uh, on the gender or the genetic abnormality of a fetus. So uh, that's that. That's my understanding of, of this particular bill. And, and, and in response to sort of your, your second your second question, I think it's, it's it's problematic to be asking the doctor to sort of uh, be able to read patients' minds because in some of these cases it may not be clear to the doctor. I would imagine about what would be a sole factor. Certainly, a genetic abnormality may be a a big factor or an important factor of, of many important factors in a situation like that. So um, that's my understanding. So it's more that it's uh, maybe an unenforceable law that we're trying to enact because we can't tell the intentions of the person or the doctor? I think that that, 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 is, that is one issue. I think the other issue is that we're concerned about the constitutionality of the bill itself. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If there are any further questions, Representative Kelly, do you have a question? You may inquire. Tell me why you believe the bill may be unconstitutional. So, in SCOTUS's ruling in Roe v. Wade and in the, in, in the case of Par Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the SCOTUS said that the 14th Amendment protects a woman's choice to have an abortion for any reason prior to fetal viability. There are some, there are some uh, restrictions that are imposed after fe fetal Does viability. Does the language say for any reason? I'm sorry? Does the language of Roe, I don't have it in front of me. Does the language of Roe say for any reason? You for said for any reason. Yes. Does the that, language that, say for any reason? That is, that is my understanding. I'm not a legal attorney. I'd be happy to get, to get you a written answer via email. But that's the essence of the question that's being sure. asked here today. Isn't sure. It? I can I can get you the reference later today. Isn't the question yeah. before the committee really the constitutional question? Right. Whether we can, within the strictures of Roe, limit one's right to choose an abortion based on these characteristics. Yes. And if Roe says for any reason, it's clear that we can't. But if Roe doesn't say that, we still might not be able to, but it will be unclear. Yes, that, that's, that's true too. Okay. Yes. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bet. Are there any further questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Please leave a witness form. And we are now uh, beyond the expired time, but have provided equal time for each side. Uh, is there anyone else to testify in opposition that has not had the opportunity? Okay, very good. That will conclude the hearing on House Bill 386. Uh, and now if we will call the roll to go into, this is the last formal part of going into full session. We uh,
started out as a subcommittee and we will now go into full session. Let's call the roll. <coughs> And members be prepared, we will um, go into executive session to consider um, the first bill that was presented today, House Bill, I believe, 457. And we will also consider uh, the tuberculosis bill, which was uh, <coughs> House Bill 257. I'm sorry, Here. executive session and for the purpose of uh, considering House Bill, first House Bill 457 and I move that House Bill 457 be voted to pass. Is there any discussion? And prior to that, there is a substitute for 457 that uh, cleaned up some language. It was in fact the bill that the speaker referred to in his description of the bill, and uh, I move that House Bill 457, the committee substitute for House Bill 457, be voted to pass. And now, is there any discussion regarding the bill we heard today, the very first bill we heard today, House Bill 457? Discussion. Then all those in favor of adopting the substitute, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, signify by saying no. No. The chair is in doubt of the vote, and so the chair will call a roll call vote. Representative Frederick? Aye. Representative Franklin? Representative White? Aye. Representative Knapp? Representative Cross? Representative Morris? Aye. Representative Wood? Aye. Representative Hodges? Representative Hodges? No. Representative Burton? No. Representative Pace? No. By a vote of five, yes, and three, no, we have approved the motion to adopt the substitute. And now I move that House Committee substitute for House Bill 457 be voted to pass. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representative Frederick? Aye. Representative Franklin? Representative White? Aye. Representative Neff? Representative Cross? Representative Neely? Aye. Representative Morris? Aye. Representative Wood? Aye. Representative Hodges? Representative Kelly? No. Representative Kirkton? No. Representative Pace? No. By your vote of five in favor and three against, you have voted House Committee substitute for House Bill 457 to pass. And now let us turn our attention to another House Committee substitute that has been distributed. And uh, this is a bill that deals with uh, tuberculosis, you recall, treatment of tuberculosis. Uh, there is a House Committee substitute that um, ends in 2C. 0.02c. And the committee substitute had some mostly grammatical but a couple of substantial sub substantive changes. Um, and one was to reduce the um, 
penalty for non-compliance from a felony to a misdemeanor. And that was in response uh, to a senator's concern. And so, in the interest of trying to uh, get this across the finish line, we made that modification. Uh, a lot of the other changes are changing the, the two letters, capital T, capital B, to the actual word tuberculosis. changes regarding the how we refer to uh, health authorities as uh, local public health authorities uh, and really there's no other substantial change to it that I can uh, recall and you will recall that this bill will it, it's first of all something that the department wants it will make it more feasible more economical for us to treat patients with tuberculosis without long extensive hospital stays by primarily providing for direct observed therapy where you actually see them take the medication because so often uh, tuberculosis goes without proper treatment for a proper length of time so it's never completely eradicated and this is an attempt to, uh, to do that. Is there any discussion on House many substitute for House Bill 257? And so to begin that discussion, just one moment. I move House Committee substitute for House Bill 257 to be voted. Yes, that's true. Proper formality, but rather than jumping just to the substitute, we have to first consider the uh, House Bill itself. So I move that House Bill 257 be voted to pass. Is there anyone who has any discussion or comments for that? Chairman, if I may, you may. I don't think you want to vote on that now, do you? I think you, after you, all you do is open the discussion with that motion, and then you offer the substitute, don't you? That is my intention now. Okay. I would now move that House Committee substitute for House Bill 257 be voted to pass. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Well, you it has been distributed. You know how we're always naming bills after people? We yeah. should name this the Doc Holiday. <laughs> That's true. All right. All too young to <laughs> yes. All right. In the interest of moving forward, uh, we want to make sure that everyone who wants to have a, a say so, some discussion on this, has had the opportunity. But if there is no discussion, then all those in favor of adopting the substitute for House Committee 257, House Committee substitute. Sub 257. Signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. You've adopted the substitute. And now, and at this time, I would move that House Committee substitute for House Bill 257 be voted due pass. This is a discussion. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you go over the first change that you talked about where some of the concerns? Yes, the change that the Senate uh, requested was changing the penalty, and I'll have to find the spot and stamp if you can help me to find the spot where we changed the penalty. Here it is on uh, page 11, lines 4 and 5, um, in which case it is a class, it used to be the previous version, the original version, a class C felony, and it now with the House Committee substitute, it is a Class A misdemeanor, okay. and that is on page 11, uh, okay. items of lines 4 and 5. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representative Frederick? Aye. Representative Franklin? Representative White? Aye. Representative Depp? Representative Cross?
By a vote of nine ayes, you have voted House Committee substitute for House Bill 257 to pass. And there being no further business for the committee, the Committee on Healthcare Policy is now adjourned.